good job introducing both of us, so I might not uh, go into all the detail here, but um, what I do think is interesting about Hopper is that he led an organization that ended up employing about 4,000 people at the end of it, right, and thousands more volunteers, and his job was to create the digital nervous system to enable those people to get the information, to knock on the right doors, and to basically run the campaign efficiently, um, which is easier said than done, probably, as we've all read about. Yeah, I, it was definitely easier said than done. When, when they hired me, they were like, here's what we're going to do. They basically said that, and I was like, okay. Sounds good. But didn't Jim Isina say, don't fuck it up? Well, that Welcome was, that to was, the team, don't fuck it up. That, that was, was definitely the very first thing. But right. before, <laughs> but shortly after that, they, they kind of laid out this, this grand scheme of what we were trying to accomplish. And then um, probably in the first kind of real discussion about this, um, there was a little bit of a uh, reality check on how difficult it was actually going to be and what some of the real problems were going to be. Like, when you're building technology for a non-technology organization, as probably some of us in the audience have done, um, there's a, an aggressive stance kind of against technology. Um, what because, do you mean by well, that? Well, because things have uh, worked in the past, so why would you want to break them? Right. Fix them, as us technologists like to call it. Um, and so uh, even, it was just Even a, at the, the, the campaign that's known to be Technology savvy. That's yeah, yeah. I mean, but think of it. Think of it from the perspective of the people who are on 2008. And so, really, you have to go back into time to think about where technology on campaigns came from, and it came from the Dean campaign right. in 2004. And then 2008, we took a lot of those learnings and we rolled them into this really great campaign. Um, and then in 2012, we said all the stuff we learned in 2008, we're going to throw out. Okay, I'm sure that was popular with some of the people. Very popular. Um, <laughs> was not popular at all. And, um, and of course, as a technologist, which I, I've come to kind of identify as a very ego-driven, kind of ridiculous world, um, where we are like, I'm here to solve your problems. Are you ready for the solution? And that's kind of what is how engineers often are. And but let me back up a bit. Why yeah. did you say we have to throw everything out? Well, I don't think that it was necessary. I, it wasn't really. It wasn't so much that we have to throw everything out, I, I, as much as in 2008, in November 2008, a, a year before that, the iPhone was released. Right around that same time, app, the App Store uh, released apps. Um, Twitter was founded in 2006. Facebook pages, which is really, they think, the keystone for doing Facebook work, <coughs> like we did on the campaign, right. um, came out in 2008. Okay. And so the difference between 2008, when all of this stuff was brand new, and 2012 was really, in 2008, I was using that technology, but in 2012, my mom was. Okay. And so there's a huge difference in how we address those things. And so a lot of the kind of ideas that we had in 2008 needed to be refreshed for 2012. Right. Um, and then some of the mistakes were, the, or the, some of the first mistakes were not necessarily addressing or acknowledging all of the needs of the people. Okay. Like the actual, like the, because, the, because the campaigns are more about people than they are about social media so, or data. Um, I think I, I, I know where you're going here because I have talked to, I've actually talked to more people in the people side um, yeah. and who manage, the thing is ca political campaigns are broken up into field f for the Obama campaign and that means that they're, they're unique in that they're very focused on getting the whole technology infrastructure is geared towards getting people knocking on doors, getting them out there, and then there's this, your engineering team, and then the, the, the sort of big data, the data crunchers, who, w the unique part of this campaign of, of 2012 was that they applied predictive modeling to absolutely everything that they did. Um, I mean, everything from who's going to vote in what area to who are the, your most, who are the most influential Twitter followers, and how, how should the campaign reach out to those people to send out messages to, the, to their friends. So, mm -hmm. um, but the, I think I know what you're getting at because there's this woman called Catherine Bracey who opened the mm -hmm. technology office in, um, in San Francisco for the Obama campaign and she wrote about it in a public, a little bit, uh, in a public 
blog post. And mm -hmm. she kind of hinted that there was some sort of, she wished there were technologists in the field as opposed to all well, I mean, there's centered in Chicago. What do you think about that? I, I don't think that, I think that's fine, but I don't think that actually matters because there's yeah. a lot of stuff at HQ. So that how it was broken up, as, as Sarah kind of briefly talked about, was you had a headquarters which had about 750 people and plus or minus 100 interns depending on the day, which was a crazy thing to do. Um, we onboarded 100 interns one day and it was, it was just, we were just stacking them in corners like firewood. Um, and they were, and, and actually for, for those of you that have worked in organizations, you always have these points that you need to automate and you'd say, well, let's write a little program to automate that. You talk to the engineering team and you automate it. We just threw interns at it. They would like, get up at five in the morning and they'd run a query and then they'd email a report out and that was our automation. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, that was, so the HQ had about 750 people and, it, and um, it ramped up and then it ramped down as we sent those people out into the field. And so a lot of the organizational planning and a lot of kind of the, uh, just what we were going to do was focused or was came out of HQ. And then what it was, it was also all about empowering people in this very hierarchical way out into the field to actually do the hard work, the most important work. So a lot of the technology we built was about facilitating that. A lot of the work that people like Jeremy Bird or Mitch Stewart did was about facilitating that. And so those are the ones that really worked in the various neighborhoods to go knock on doors and all of that. And when you hear about the ground game or the ground force that Obama had, it's really talking about that, which is field. And that was a huge portion of the campaign. And I, I don't know the exact number of volunteers that we had. I think it was um, probably close to uh, a, a little under a million. And um, that's a lot of people to kind of manage um, in an organization. It is. Um, so one of the th things that you built was a uh, dashboard, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if any of you guys volunteered out, out here. Um, well, dashboard, yeah. I can describe yeah. it a little right. bit. Dashboard was basically, to put it into like a, a exclusively business terms, was a business process management application that it combined with a little bit of a CRM. And so it, it allowed our users, you know, no matter where they were, to kind of interact and, and map and um, uh, understand what processes they needed to go through to do their jobs. And then it also allowed them to interact with their local neighborhoods. So imagine if you were to a sales force and you logged into your application and it said, oh, here's all your fellow salespeople and here's the work that you needed to do and here's the metrics that you are trying to hit <coughs> and here's how you hit them already. Um, and so we just created, used kind of the nuances of social consumer applications and applied this to what is ultimately a very enterprise sales force application and then put that in a, in a, a target it towards our field organization. Um, and if you replay what I just said, it sounds a lot, <laughs> pretty BS actually. Um, <laughs> but, I, but it's like, you know, the idea of like business process and enterprise software and how do you make it more consumer and more social is kind of what we did. Well, how did it work out? I mean. It, was, it worked out in, in all things campaign when you have a, a million people using your software. Some people use it and some people didn't. It's been hilarious to afterwards because I talked to people and they were like, dashboard was the greatest thing. It changed my entire life. It made everything easier. And then the person next to him is like, well, I logged in once. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's just, it's just, you know, some people, and you never knew who it was. It, I, I would often think it was younger people that were going to log in and use the right. software, but it actually wasn't. It was much more about the people who just um, were, for whatever reason, more interested in logging in. We found that our biggest, um, one of our biggest consumers of it were people with iPads. Um, and so we made it aggressively work well on iPads because we looked at our, our stats and we said, oh, if people with iPads are using this, let's, let's jump down that. Okay, so um, what's the uh, biggest lesson that you learned mm -hmm. while you're on the campaign, both in, on the technology side and on the managerial side? Um, Managing tech teams. Yes, lessons, lessons is a, there's a lot. Um, there's probably enough for me to talk all day. Um, Probably the biggest lesson, I don't even know if I, can, I have a biggest lesson, but right. on the tech side, excuse me, we used uh, Amazon Web Services quite a bit and it really helped us scale. Um, and it helped us scale with, without spending all of our money. So that was very um, successful and I think I would do that over and over again and suggest that people use that. On the managerial side, one thing that we, we really tried hard to do was um, instill a good culture um, we knew that we were going to be working in a very crazy and insane environment, and so we knew that we needed to 
the people that we are going to be working with, we needed them to really enjoy what they were doing and be excited about um, the work they were doing outside of the fact that they were reelecting the president that they all kind of believed in. It was more so like because even though that's true, it still sucks to work uh, 20 hours a day for 18 months. Um, and so what can we do to make it a good place to work? And we did a lot of things where um, kind of followed um, the footsteps of some of these or on the, stood on the shoulders of some of these companies that have done this before. Google does this thing called TGIF where they get together every Friday. Um, we did something which was our Friday retro where we, every Friday we got together and we kind of talked about the week. We talked about some of the challenges, but most importantly we talked about our successes. And so we tried to celebrate every small battle we won, um, whether it was launching a product or whether it was getting new users, um, just so that, the, so that our engineers and the people involved saw progress and saw that we were making a difference. Um, towards the end of the campaign, um, we aggressively focused on not going down um, and not having downtime or, or having catastrophic failures um, just because it would be terrible if we screwed up on election day. Um, and so we spent a lot of time talking about that and figuring out that and so that's what we use those meetings for. But I think that a lot of the lessons that came out of this were about people, less about technology. It was mostly about how to manage people effectively, how to uh, work with the people that you're working with to um, mitigate disaster? Well, one of the interesting things, that, as I, I mentioned to you before, I was reading your colleague um, Dylan Richard's ebook on um, managing, uh, doing this, this uh, catastrophic failure testing mm -hmm. and, and also just managing technology projects. And one thing he mentioned was that um, near the beginning it was hard for the team to sort of, they fa you found, yourself going down this rabbit hole of not being able to priori prioritize projects properly. So you ended up breaking the tech team. Mm -hmm. You had 50 engineers under you, right? Well, we had about 40 tech staff. Okay, so 40 30 tech engineers. staff, right. So um, you had all these people and then you broke them up into small teams mm -hmm. to focus on projects. And then, but the problem with that is that they, they didn't end up, end up, they ended up sort of being factionalized. Yeah. In, in a, I think it's. I think that's. Uh, I don't think it's as, as bad as they were factionalized, right. but they definitely were focused on their own little things. So the history is, uh, when we cut, came into the campaign, we said, well, what do we need to get done? And in very, uh, you know, campaign style, it was everything. Um, and so we said, well, okay, well, what things, you know, what is the priority? And they're all like, well, everything's priority one. Um, so we're like, well, can we eke this out a little bit? And they were like, no. Um, so we just had to do everything. And so we started out doing everything. And we, I mean, we had a good list and we had a bunch of different places we needed to go. And so we, we started just placing everyone on all things. Um, but we knew that this wasn't going to work. So what we actually did, which um, turned out to be kind of a funny thing in the press because they got it so wrong, was we built a platform that, was, that would allow us to do everything. And so we built something that allowed us to share data between our various data sources. And um, it really became a foundation, and so or a, a foundation of our software. So that was called Narwhal. Right. And so Narwhal um, was, you know, just purely technical, was a giant API, and so it, it was the thing that helped us do targeted sharing, and it also helped us do logins, and it also helped us do contributions, and it just it was more of a concept than an actual <coughs> product. But we had a team of all the people that worked on Narwhal, and they worked on Narwhal, and they had to interact with everyone. So it wasn't so much that it was factionalized, like it wasn't like they were factions that didn't work out right. work with one another. It was just that it was team-based because we all couldn't work on all things all the time. Um, we needed people to be focused and say, hey, you are the Narwhal lead, you are the lead of call tool, you are the lead of dashboard, and then there's engineers that work with you to solve these big problems. Um, well, I guess I'm, uh, my question is, how do you strike the balance? Did you figure yeah. out a balance in the end between? Um, I don't. I don't know if it was about balance so much as it was about how do we be how how do how do we <coughs> make sure that we are shipping right. in a very quick succession. So um, what we made sure we did is we we did releases and we deployed code as often as possible, so that we could have a very quick cycle of looking at did we do this correctly? If yes, then continue. Right. If no, then fix it. Um, because we knew that we were going to have to react on basically what was a 24-hour news cycle. Right. Um, you never knew if you had to, in, you know, include Big Bird in an app randomly. Yeah. Um, and so it was like, you know, so because of this, we had to be able to release things very quickly. And so we really just, it was actually, everyone worked together very well. And okay. they, they kind of, um, 
it was, it was actually really great how it turned out. Okay. Now, it started out much harder because we, we were struggling with how do we do everything, um, which is impossible. Right. Okay. So, um, what were your hairiest moments? Um, I mean, I know the reason I ask is because, like you say, there might be a big bird moment or, um, you know, during the uh, presidential debates between the President Obama and... Well, the first and, one was really right. fun. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. But, um, uh, you know, during these debates, they, the campaign could be getting... I, was, I read that, that, that um, they could be getting, like, $3 million, taking in $3 million an hour. Yeah. So if... So we didn't want that to go yeah, down. Yeah, you didn't want to get that to go down. No. Did you ever have any well, hairy moments? We did, but we... Um, one of the things that I made sure to do was um, we hired people who had done a lot of this stuff before. And so we hired from people like Twitter and Quora and Google and Facebook, et cetera, um, specifically because we knew that they had solved some of these big problems before because we didn't want to have to invent these things. We didn't want to have to start from zero. We wanted to kind of game it as much as possible. Um, and so we brought a lot of these people in and you know they were able to say, oh, well, we need to build our solutions have to be highly available. That was like the default. Um, and so when we did things like and, and you built part of the whole pro the reason why um, you did these failure, these game days and these live action re role playing days was so that you could establish procedures, right, for, well, yeah, for yeah. when, but when it, things go down. But it starts in the beginning where we were, we set out to be highly available. We set out to make sure that we were mitigating failure. We set out to make sure that we weren't going to go down. Um, and then we aggressively tested those things. So a great example is our contribution system, which a lot of people gave money through, um, didn't require a database connection. Um, so if the database went down, it was fine. Um, and that was something that isn't necessarily obvious at first when you're building something like this. Um, we had to get to that point, but once we got to that point, then we were much less worried with whether the database will stay up or down, which is something that I think a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to figure out. And so as we went through that, I'm we sorry, decided- how, how did you get to that point? You said it, was, it um, wasn't obvious, so how did you get to that point? Well, we, we constantly tested what we thought the failure scenarios would be. Um, and this led ourselves to do this game day, um, which we did quite a bit. All of October, we spent kind of testing our failure situations. And so we constantly brought our sites down. We constantly broke our software. We constantly pushed our engineers to continue to look at what could fail. Um, in 2008, there was a software product called Houdini, which allowed people to kind of track who had voted. And by 9.30 on election day, it had broken and was not coming back up. Um, so that software product didn't have a really good, um, right. people didn't like it. Um, so we created, um, <laughs> so that was the story that we're told. We're basically told that software always fails. So we're like, well, let's fix that. Let's patch that. Because we, as a technologist, especially as a CTO, I know that software always fails. Let's just take a quick poll. How many have been happy with their software products the first time they're released? Okay, see, so that's about it. That's what I, was, that what I would expect. It never works. And so we know it never works, so we shouldn't act like it never, it, it does work. And so what we did instead was we acted like it wouldn't work. And we made sure that we spent a lot of very deliberate time, like very deliberate, saying, today we are going to understand how this will break. The idea being that on election day or GOTV, which is the, the three days before election day, um, that we can say, okay, this happened, this is, the, this is what's kind of appearing, oh, let's turn to page 23 and you type in these commands and it's fixed. And so then on election day, we didn't actually have any downtime. We didn't have any downtime for the GOTV time period, which was the first time that that had happened in modern history. And if you look at the dialogue that came off the media, um, there was a lot of talk about Orca from the Republican side, which did have some problems. The, the ironic thing is Orca was the exact same app as Houdini in 2008. Um, and so they actually were almost feature to feature similar. And so the, the fact that that went down, when ours went down in 2008, I think shows what we learned and what, what the Republicans um, haven't learned yet, which they're, they're apparently learning right now. Well, that brings we, me to the, talk. to the next point. Um, the, the Republican National Committee came mm -hmm. out with a report called the Growth and Opportunity uh, Report uh, last week, I think it was. And um, they basically said, let's copy the Obama campaign. And- uh, That seems to be popular. Yeah. Um, 
Do you think uh, they'll be able to catch up in 2016? So I was actually talking to someone earlier about this, and I'm, yeah. I'm really worried that they're just going to end up like looking at the transition between Slavey and myself, and they're going to hire a homeless person. Um, <laughs> But uh, um, really, I think the, uh, you know, the, thing, the thing is, and I actually worry about this for both the Democrats and the Republicans, because the Democrats are going to be in, just in a similar situation, which is they are going to be in a primaries, they're going to have the same layout as the Republicans will in 2016. I don't think there is much of a difference between the two parties in that regard. Um, my concern with all of this is that if this requires an investment in technology that starts at zero, and the Obama for America campaign um, committed to that, that um, investment. I was hired in April, end of April in 2011. The campaign was founded in the beginning of April. Um, so I had 18 months to do my job. Um, how long will the Republicans or the Democrats have? Three months, six months, maybe, you know, right. to, to, to do this technology? And so uh, there's a couple things that I think could happen. Either an organization could pop up that supports the party which hasn't necessarily worked in the past, um, which regardless of which party, or there's open source software, whether it comes from OFA or it comes from somewhere else that does support it, but that hasn't necessarily worked in the past. And these, these products are so specific to the candidate. Um, for instance, Barack Obama is very big on a specific type of field organizing, which Jeremy Bird and Mitch Joyce do, so our software represented that. You can't use that software if you don't believe in that. And, um, we didn't win because our software was good. Like that's true. Like I don't think if, if that's if people think that, then they're obviously not looking at the fact that we won because we got more people to vote and more people stood out and said, you know, we don't want this other guy. And so the, the software just made it so we had an easier time contacting. Yes, those but people. I mean you're downplaying it a little bit. I mean, you got people out to vote, but you, the campaign also managed to get more people. They found people that may not have voted before to get out and vote, so it, yeah. it, it was important. Well, I mean, yeah, that's true, but right. I mean, the, but it's, it's that program is the same on both sides, it right. just, we just did it way better. Right. And so there, I don't think there was a technology innovation there as much as we executed. Right. Um, and so I think that the idea of you need a CTO, probably someone with a beard, um, <laughs> who's going to, you know, come in and disrupt things, which is the thread that's coming out of a lot of these conversations is wrong. I think it yeah. should be, you need to invest in technology very early and in a very global way. And I wonder how that's going to manifest itself with the primaries, because I, I'm very worried that that actually won't work out. Right, okay. Um, why did you do everything in the house? I mean, yeah. one example is, um, one thing that I think you guys would be interested in is, is uh, th there's a whole bunch of people between 18 and 29, as you probably know, um, that don't have phones, that don't have landlines. And the Obama campaign was sort of fretting about this. And Teddy Goff, who's the head of the digital side of things for the Obama campaign, said that the campaign was able to reach five million people, right, um, through Facebook, through this um, Get Out the Vote app, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, it was a social voting app um, that they built. But there was also this company called Votizen that did something similar. And so why did you... <laughs> This is a very complex why did you, question. Yeah, why did you um, build your own app instead of just using someone else's technology? Specifically with Votizen, um, there was an interesting part of Votizen <laughs> where they chose to say they were nonpartisan, right. which means that the campaign can't trust them. Interesting. Um, I hadn't actually thought, realized well, I mean, that. Because yeah. if you're a Republican or a Democrat and someone says, I'm not, why would you trust them? They can give your data to someone else. Right. Like there's just because in, in the way of business, it's the same way that you know, we, we as, and this was fascinating to me because I was like, well, they seem to have a good product. And then I was like thinking through like the ramifications of us using them because of like all startups, you can share data, you use your data for all these things. But then if, if a Republican were to come in and because we're using it in a big way and they generate learnings from that, we would be benefit, that we'd be benefiting the Republicans. But you um, still, they, I mean, they could still, uh, I mean, Republicans v registered for, the Obama uh, get out the vote app. Well, it does, if they it register for us, then yeah. we get all the data. Right. Um, and it's all us, and we can choose what to do with it. And if we learn more from that, we don't inadvertently, through that relationship, share that with Republican counterparts. Right. And so this is a weird world, so right? So it's all I think about it's, data ownership. I think that, I think that the, the conversation of, you know, 
if vote is in, is, is that's what screws up that conversation. I think the question of why do we do things in-house right. is more of a question on tech, right. which was um, we needed to move very fast to build very specifically targeted applications for us. They weren't something that we could buy. We looked and tried to buy every single application we possibly could find because we didn't have time to build it. We just didn't find anything that A, we felt could stand up to the traffic we were getting. Okay. Um, an example is our call tool. Our call tool got about 10,000 users um, a week for about 17 months. And then for the last four days, um, that same call tool did hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of simultaneous users um, just in the last four days. And in the last um, day, did about a million um, total calls. When in the before, it had been doing 100. And so all of our vendors are like, yeah, we can do that. But I, don't, I, don't, I didn't believe them. Um, and I would rather us uh, spend a little bit more time and, and pay the same amount of money because it wasn't, it wasn't about money because these, all these people charge a lot. Um, but w then we know and we can verify and we can test. And if it screws up in real time, we can fix it. Okay. Well, that makes me think about, um, you know, you said that the next candidate, Democra the de next Democratic candidate is going to have to start from scratch. But you guys built all this software. Um, Mm -hmm. This huge infrastructure. Why can't you sort of keep it alive somehow and and use it again and tweak it next time around? I think that it will. Yeah. Um, OFA 4.0, which is um, organizing for action, um, ha has stated, and they, they're very seemingly um, interested in open sourcing a lot of it. But you know, back to the conversation about the candidate, it all depends on right. the candidate. Right. If the newest Democratic candidate comes out and is like, well, we're going to do organizing differently, then all of our software doesn't really matter. Right. Um, and there's also some, like, the, the interesting magic <coughs> that we have is competitive, and we wouldn't open source that. Right. So the modeling and all that fun stuff is competitive. Um, but the other thing is, is um, software changes a lot in four years. Um, the uh, assumption that software that we wrote in 2011 for an election in 2012 would last until right. 2016 is, is false. Right. Um, if we open source everything today, you would have a very easy job of running a presidential campaign in 2011. Um, I mean, that's true. Like okay. That's because that's where it was built for the technology that was then. And even since the campaign has, has gotten done, like we, we would make different decisions now based on the technology landscape that is out there today. Right. than we did in 2011. Okay. Um, we would use a lot of, like a great example of this is Parse, the startup in Silicon Valley. Um, they create a kind of a, a, a backbone for your mobile, mobile apps. Um, they're much more proven now than they were in 2011, and so maybe we would use them now instead of when we passed in 2011. Um, and so as these things become more mature, we will use more of these, these platforms. So I think what it is is um, <coughs> the thread that why don't we just open source it and it saves everyone is false because people who are saying that don't really know about software. <laughs> um, and the other thing is it's very hard to open source things. So we want to make sure we do, when we do open source them that, they're, that they survive because, there's, right. because it is important. And there's some really good software out there that we wrote that would help even you guys run your businesses um, because it's, just, it's about how do you do cloud computing in a very large scale? How do you move really fast? How do you aggressively deploy things, et cetera? OK. Um, what do you think? the key technologies, what do you think we'll see in 2016? This time around yep. we saw big data, you know, insights from big data, yep. empowering these door knocking campaigns. What are we gonna see in 2016? So there's three or four things that I've been thinking about a lot and I, I actually, um, I really think these are, this is what we're gonna see. So the first thing is, is traditional voter contact, knocking on doors, calling on landlines, is just gonna continue to become more efficient and so it's not going to become irrelevant. We're still going to do it. It's just going to become less efficient. And so we're, st we're going to need to connect more and more social and more and more of this kind of internet communication to these traditional measures. Um, the next thing is um, voter suppression. Okay. I think technology around voter suppression is going to be um, more and more needed. We Can use you explain what voter suppression is? Voter suppression is um, usually nefarious organizations, oftentimes secretaries of state, um, trying to stop people from voting. So limiting voting hours, um, creating situations where there's inadvertently or vertently, if that's a real word, lines, um, and just kind of generally um, stopping people from voting. Um, this seems to me to be a pretty bipartisan issue. 
everyone should have the access to voting that everyone has. Um, I don't think it should be, like there shouldn't be rules that, that stop people from voting. Um, and so with that said, we used Ushahidi to kind of um, track where there were problems. A great example of this was Ohio and Virginia where there were long voting lines. You use Ushahidi. Ushahidi? Yeah, could you explain to, to Ushahidi is one of the most brilliant applications ever. It was started in I think 2008 in reaction to a coup in Kenya um, where they were tracking events that were kind of violent events and they were basically able to put a Google map up and then um, track incoming SMSs and reports of violence and so that people could lead their lives and not be sucked into violence and so they could avoid roaming mobs and all this other stuff. Um, we didn't use it because we had any of that, um, thank goodness. Um, but um, the Ushahidi team open sourced it and so everyone has used this, they've used it all over. They use it in Chicago to track snowstorms and the kind of problems that happened there. A lot of city governments tra use it to just track various events and data. So um, how did you use it to track voter suppression? So what we did is we, uh, people would report in that, okay, the line is too long. They're okay. shutting down the poll. They've ran out of materials. And that would go into our database. Right. It would go on a map. And then we would have our lawyers um, try and solve those problems. And so it had a real-time aspect of us being able to view what's happening. Right. In the future, I think this is going to be most very important. We're going to need to react quicker and faster. And this is worldwide. This isn't just the US. It's almost more important worldwide. Um, and so I think this is, this is a big thing that we should be focusing technology on. And then the final thing, and this is what I'm mostly worried about, is um, uh, attacks on the internet, so cyber attacks. I promised myself I would not say cyber ever again, and then here <laughs> I am doing it again. Um, I'm glad you came up with it, because I didn't yeah. want to use it. Um, but I, I do think that, I mean, we were very, very lucky, and we did not have any disruptions um, in the Obama campaign in 2012. It is, it, it is in the press that, it, that um, the Obama campaign and the McCain campaign were hacked in 2008 by a foreign entity. Um, and I'm, I'm worried that in 2016 that there's a lot of opportunities for whether it is for hijinks or whether it is for um, fun or but I'm worried actually more so than that about people who are trying to actually cause disruption. Um, because it is complicated and because there are a lot of weaknesses, looking back there are a lot of opportunities for someone to actually really hurt our program or more importantly hurt some of the voter registration that's out there hurt some of these infrastructures that aren't protected from our city governments and our state governments that are helping people have voter access. Um, and so that's one of the things I'm very concerned about and I do think that we need to invest in um, security in a, in a very real way. You mean campaigns? I think everyone, campaigns, right. governments, et cetera. Okay, um, <coughs> last question because we've, we've only got two minutes. Um, is there something on the campaign that you're really proud of that, that we haven't heard about that hasn't been written about? Um, there is one thing that I think uh, everyone that w interacted with our software used and no one thought about, which was um, our identity provider. So every time you logged in, you used this piece of software that um, we aggressively, aggressively um, worked on. And so we made it much quicker. We uh, made it work. Um, but what it did is it allowed all of our users to have one username and password to log into all of our applications. Um, and this is something that when we did user experience testing that we heard over and over again. Like I hate remembering all these passwords. I can't remember all these passwords. And so we solved that problem. Uh, but it, what it also did, it so also. Ha was it a piece of software? That you yeah, okay. it was a piece of software. And we used open standards. We used OpenID and OAuth. And so it was just a very simple piece of software that stood between all of our apps. You logged in with it. Um, the thing that it did that I think was, I'm excited about is it also increased our conversion rates on our donations and all of our other applications because it was so fast and easy to use. And so since we spent a lot of time testing and making sure that logging in, something as simple as logging in, worked, all of our other apps benefited. So um, is this something that um, people doing businesses can I think they do. Can they, create they, on their own? A lot, you see this happening yeah. where they will unify a login form and they will just constantly iterate and make that happen. Facebook spent a lot of time right. on this. Um, Yahoo, you can see that when, they, when they, they, they went through, after the acquisition of Flickr, you saw them roll out their unified login um, right. across all their products that, that they, you know, things like that. Um, a lot of people screw this up though. Um, Google for the longest time had a very hard time with it and they just recently have made it much more efficient. Because the thing is, if you have to log in to do something and you have a hard time logging in, you won't end up doing that thing. Right. Um, and so we spent a lot of our resources making that very fast and it, it turned out to be um, kind of a, the, the hidden gem. And it's also still working. Have you found cool. any use case for the, uh, Oh, we use, 
we used Facebook and um, we did have Twitter for a little while, um, but it was, we used Facebook and then regular Barack Obama login. So you could sign up with Facebook. We definitely used a lot of that. Um, I think the, the clock says we're out of time, but um, Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much.